Didn't your investors say that because of that failure, that made you more valuable to people? Yeah, they looked at me and they're like, yeah, we're only investing in you because you had this failure. And like, I saw how you navigated that. And I like that. So we're going to fund your new business again. I was like, what? Like, wow, you, you're actually treating me with a bit of respect, a lot of respect and a lot of confidence. Like, I feel I lost all your money, dude. And he was like, no, like the best entrepreneurs are those with failures under their belt. And I'm like, wow, what a radical concept because my morale is so low. My self-esteem was so low. And then you had this like multi-billionaire who's like, yeah, I believe in you, even though you failed. And I was like, wow, that's radical. So yeah, being uncomfortable was one of the big things we, we had to like instill in our young people, right? Like early team, like what? We're never going to settle we're always going to push. So we had this biannual thing. Every six months, we ask ourselves what's happening in the next six that we have never done before. And I don't care who you are. You just come up with something that we want to do for the next six. And that became a bit of our DNA, kind of learning from the tech companies. Like what's the learning from Apple again? Like, they're always launching all these random things like Apple Arcade, Apple TV, right? Apple Watch. And then we we're like, what's the next six months vision? What's the next pipeline of stuff that we're going to make? And, and we kind of adopted that into our own planning systems because we were a meme page. We had nothing not like we could sell you anything else except and so we had to like keep pushing that thought process which eventually allowed us to launch all these other things that we eventually launched and so that creator economy is very very huge now what do you hope to achieve with the creators network that you've built yeah, a lot of people ask me, how did I come up with that? And I was feeling very stuck in 2019, right? I was in Malaysia, we were doing all right. I was in Philippines, we were growing fast. And the next thing was like, oh, okay, let's open more of the same concepts in the rest of Southeast Asia. We've not even touched Indonesia, Thailand, two markets I really, really respect and want to open at some point. But I'm like, yeah, it's the same thing. We want to do the same thing. And I was like, I, I get into these ditches mentally where I, I need to like just step away from everything and kind of get inspired and I was in one of these moments where oh, I felt very stuck I felt very bored I felt very uninspired even though everything was going so well and true to the principle of staying uncomfortable I, I felt we were missing something. I felt as the CEO, I needed to come up with a new direction. And, and personally, I felt it a lot. So I retreated into my personal space. I hid in the meeting rooms all day. And I was just reading and watching YouTube videos and, and just thinking a lot about anything and everything. And then it struck me like as cliche as it can be. I had a light bulb moment because I saw that TikTok was inching its way into the, the world of social media. It was right at the tip of its early beginnings. And, and I was like, wow, like, I think there could be something more. I think this could give birth to a new generation of social media creators that we've never seen before. I think it could spark a new wave of creativity that would propel more young people to make videos. Vine could have answered that call, but it was too early and it just didn't work out for them. I think TikTok could be it. And so I went on this plane of the thought where what if all these creators were coming online exponentially what did it mean for us where were we in this whole spectrum in southeast asia well, how would people treat us or think of us knowing the brand of sgm get pget was something that people perhaps recognized and so i was like okay and what other externality was happening at a global level that was not going to slow down. Again, thinking into the future. And I realized that when I first started, mobile data was so expensive. I was paying like 50 Singapore dollars or more for like three gigs. And then at that point in 2019, I was paying like 20 Singapore dollars for 20 gigs. And, and then I was reading all these annual reports by the telcos, which is die because they don't know how to make money anymore. You can't charge for SMS. You can't charge for talk time. You can't charge for data. Then what do you charge on? Nobody watches uh, pay TV. Nobody subscribes anymore. And I'm like, wow. Disruption at the data level, infrastructure level is also rapidly happening. And then I looked at the Southeast Asia landscape and I was like, wow, that's just going to keep happening. Like the mobile phones are also cheaper and cheaper. Like Xiaomi is launching like $100 phones that are so powerful. And I looked at that trend and I'm like, that's it. That's the disruption that the big boys can't navigate because they have fixed infrastructure of satellites and print facilities and broadcast facilities and then you had this massive like in five years data is free basically you close your eyes you get data right but it was not happening yet in philippines and it happened in malaysia way ahead of us and i was like data becomes commoditized phones become commoditized then everybody becomes a creator 
then what happens? So that was the thinking that I had. And I remember thinking about this in the room. And I was like, oh my God, we are the, at the epicenter of it because we can now call ourselves the OGs. Like nobody else can call themselves the OGs because we're the first to do stuff like that. Like people make funny videos on TikTok. Like we were the first ones to do it. And I also looked at that and I went, no way these guys can monetize their content. It's going to be so hard because unlike Instagram, Instagram, you have a pretty face, you have nice filters, you hold your product and you get paid. But on TikTok, like nobody cares how you look. You just make a funny content on a funny monologue and how you stitch it together in terms of pacing music. You're not going to get paid for that. Like it's hard to get paid for that. And we know how to get paid for that. So I was like, I think we can teach people. I think we can be a platform for creators because we have clients who also don't want to work with new creators because they're like, this is too much risk. Why would I work with this young kid? Like, no, no, no. I only want to work with you because I trust you. And I realized like Asia was Quan C driven, right? What I told them mattered because they trusted me that a trust that was built that was over five, six years. And the hypothesis was, what if I could get these guys trained up with the stuff that we learned? And what if I could tell people to trust them because they associated with us? They were trained by us. And that was really the, the, the breakthrough that I had, that this is going to grow like crazy. We are going to get disrupted as content creators in the next couple of years. We've already been disrupted with amazing new creators, but the problems remained the same. Like creators don't know how to monetize. The platforms can't engage with all these creators. The brands can't engage with all these creators. And so I could place ourselves at the center of it all and figure out what services and what value we could bring to these creators. So that was my lily had light bulb moment, which allowed me to birth the concept of Hammer Creators Network. And I was like, okay, I can't do this. I'm not at a stage where I can manage so many things. So I went to my first employee and I was like, it's your time to shine, right? I think you have what it takes to lead this new team. That's KC, right? That's KC, yeah. And I moved the chess pieces, right? So I got my first few employees to manage the content business and then I moved Cassie the first employee to manage the creator business and I moved some of these employees around and I'm like okay this is your baby I'm just the the guy playing chess and who came out with this idea let's validate it like go run and try to get deals and try to sign creators and let's figure it out right and then COVID hit before that, right, Cassie was working also with Brian Tiong who has tremendous experience how did he get on board? So Brian was actually a random guy. I, I, I believe in serendipity. I believe in the forces of nature coming together to align stars for you to meet people. I truly believe in serendipity. If you were religious, you would call it God's plan. If you were not religious, you would call it fate or serendipity. But I believe in it, which is why I don't close doors on opportunities. I have been taught through maybe my sales experience that don't close a door onto any opportunity to network, meet new people, because you never know who you're going to meet in that meeting. That could change the course of your life. And I've closed deals before where literally it's like, oh, here's my friend. He also needs a house and then ends up buying a really big property and then ends up becoming my biggest paycheck for the year. And it came from nowhere. So that mindset came to me. And so like Brian was not somebody I knew. I literally attended a networking event <laughs> at our law firm's office opening. And I'm like, oh, I'm so busy. Why would I want to go to my law firm's opening to meet lawyers, to drink and talk? I need to build this company, right? So I was like half-half and I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's hold that principle of keeping opportunities open. And so I show up at this networking event uh, and my plan was just to like bounce after 30 minutes. I go there and then I meet all these people and then like one of this guy comes up and he was like, hey, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. I'm so-and-so and, and I think I can help your business. So we, we end up chatting and it's not Brian, but he's like really cool guy. We end up having some second degree connections and he was like, hey, I think you should meet somebody. Can I come by to your office next week? And I was like, sure. Like, okay. So he brings Brian Tiong into my office and I'm like, you should meet Brian. Brian is like one of the most successful media entrepreneurs entrepreneurs in Vietnam and he's Singaporean. By that time, I was like, I have probably met everybody who I should meet in the media segment in Singapore. I've never even heard of your name. I can't even Google you. You don't even exist. Who are you? And so he tells his story in my office and I'm like mind blown, right? I'm like, are you kidding me? You built Vietnam's largest creator network in two years and you're not even Vietnamese? And you listed the company and I was like, 
wow, crazy story. So I become so intrigued that we end up talking nonstop and, and I pursued him on countless coffee meetings just to learn from him. And I really love to learn from people who have so much experience and knowledge. And I just kept buying him coffees and I was like, please, please, please meet me again. And he gave me all these ideas for the network that was just next level ideas. And I was like, wow, I have not met a single person like you with knowledge and thoughts like that. And I'm like, why don't you join us? So that was really how we met and he ended up becoming a partner in this business. You joined and as you said, COVID hit. So how did it impact your business? Well, COVID was scary, man. Like we legit didn't know any other business. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what was the financial, physical, emotional impact impact on on all of us and we were scared right so like again I had all this like startup literature in my head I recognized very clearly we were going to wartime there's peacetime and wartime so wartime and I'm really into like military and warfare and stuff like that right so I was like okay I need to switch into wartime mode so what that meant was tightening your belt right we tightened all expenses we threw away all unnecessary expenditure we prepared everybody for war so the day before lockdown we we did a town hall with the region we told every Everybody to be prepared for the worst and the worst being that people would get laid off people would get sick we would lose members because of layoffs or whatever but we needed to be mentally prepared and the only way we could help ourselves is to fight the hardest that we have ever fought individually collectively we needed everybody to if if you put the analogy of everybody on a dragon boat you needed to paddle like you've never paddled before because every stroke that you're going to paddle was going to perhaps mean that you can drive an extra runway for your colleagues for your team so that people won't get laid off and i don't know the depth of this crisis but all i know is you need to paddle as hard as you can and that was my rally a war cry to the team and I didn't know how they would respond. We've never had wartime like that before. And the guys responded like warriors. They huddled in. I had people calling me after the town hall saying, you know what? My family is doing okay. You don't have to pay me salary for three months. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm not even at a position of financial stress yet. I'm just like 10 steps ahead telling you what to expect. And then we have people saying, giving up their salaries. And I'm like, wow, I was so touched because we were by no means in a financial situation that was even distressed. We were okay. It was just the start. And then people started volunteering their time. They started like organizing things and they started working really, really hard. Like we didn't have any SOPs for like work from home or shoot from home. People started designing these things. People with vehicles started picking up stuff from the office and sending it to their colleagues. They did it all by themselves. It was all self-organized after that town hall. And we were amazed, right? And obviously we saw the impact of business going down because advertising is the last thing you do in a pandemic. In a wartime, people don't want to promote their products. People just want to huddle up. And so naturally, revenues went down, we, we, we lost business, but because we were prudent, because we were cost efficient, we were able to just sort of huddle in and wait and see what happens. And the mission statement of the company came through so brightly during this dark time, which is the whole country is suffering from Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines. If our mission statement is to better the lives of these people, there is no better time than now. There is no darker days than now. And we need to come through, like we need to bring joy, we need to bring happiness when people are struggling and people responded the content was amazing people started coming out with all sorts of innovative content we started opening up because we had all these creators right we started asking creators to make stuff and we would feature it and that allowed more content to be populated because everybody was bored so we started cross-posting content from platforms and creators and members of public onto our main channels as a catalyst for content performance or think of it like a broadcasting platform. We started broadcasting content from these creators and the content output went up by 400% in, in the period of the lockdown and the traction went up amazingly. And, and then when the economic impact was quite clear that some brands could rebound, there was not an equal lockdown in terms of financial opportunity. The digital services saw our content Content. And they were like, guys, we need to work with you. So that allowed us to rebound at the business level and the business started to pick up. And underlying, we felt this deep sense of purpose and conviction in everything that we did. And I would say it was a defining moment of the content business and why we do what we do. Why did we even start the company became very clear as a medium for our mission. And then the creator network was also at a position where you want to recognize that we have over a hundred creators 
outside of Singapore in Philippines and Malaysia. And many of these creators shared stories of how their parents lost their jobs. Many of them are young people and they really were struggling financially and TikTok or content creation was an outlet for them to express themselves as a gateway. And we started to get deals for them to put paychecks on their table and they would write to us and say, wow, I never thought I could monetize this. Like, this is amazing. So that again sprung a new sense of purpose, right? Where wow, suddenly we were financially impacting people outside of our company. And that was so amazing that the HCN team was just like, let's keep giving them paychecks. In a pandemic, let's pay them. Let's get jobs for them. Let's give income to them. Let's empower them. Let's teach them because they're all stuck at home. Let's empower them with knowledge. Let's empower them with deals, with money. There's no better way to get through a pandemic than to get paid. So that also became so purposeful, so meaningful for us. And that's really a bit of a revelation for us in a really tough year. For those who want to be creators or who are currently creators, do you have any one big piece of advice for them? Yeah, I mean, the constant advice I always say is put it out there. Just put it out, right? Like, don't worry too much about creating the perfect piece of content. Don't worry too much about, oh, you're not good enough. You're not good looking enough. You're not this enough. There's a lot of that self-doubt when you want to become a creator. I think the best creators, all creators evolve over time. People change. Everything changes. The, the infrastructure, the landscape of what you're playing. The first thing you need to do is just put it out there. If you have an idea, put it out there, validate it, and you never know what's going to happen from there. Carl, thank you so much for all the time that you've given me for this interview. I normally love to end all my conversations with these questions. So the first one is this, have you found your why? Yeah, I think as I have shared my story through this podcast, reason why I'm doing this is purpose, right? I think a lot about purpose. I think a lot about the limited time we have on earth and we don't have enough time to do random things or things we don't find purpose in. So I definitely think I found my why. And right now that is really to empower the next generation of creators and to really bring content out into the world that betters the lives of the audiences, right? Content that sheds light into stories that should be told, content that matters to people, content that brings joy and smiles to people. It might not necessarily be made by us all the time but if we can help and empower the next wave of creators across this part of the world and maybe hopefully globally at some level someday that would be extremely meaningful for us so definitely i think i found my why and what kind of legacy would you want to leave behind that's a really great question because I started the business when I had no children. Now, uh, a couple of years on, I have two young boys. And a big part of my journey as an entrepreneur has been, what is the purpose of building business, right? Like, I know this is my purpose, but what is the wider purpose of everything? And I reference a Malaysian entrepreneurial legend, Robert Kwok. I read his memoir uh, a couple of years ago when it came out. And one of the ending chapters of his book, he talks about how in his 90s now, he looks at his children and they all have their different passions and he has built this empire that has been passed on to them and they have this base to build on. It's, it's not necessarily just taking over businesses, but also giving them this platform to create greater impact into the world through their ideas, through their execution. And to me, I thought that was an extremely meaningful perspective because a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we always don't have time and capacity to do things outside of work. And having children was certainly one of them. You don't have enough time for children to be a father or to be a parent. And, and I, when I read that, I think he has like six kids or something like that. It was super meaningful for me that in my might not be a continuation of the business itself. It might cease to exist some point down the road. But I think building a brand that stays for 100 years or more, building a business that stays the cost of time and giving my children and, and my colleagues' children or whoever that we still have in the business by then, a platform to do more, a platform to do greater things. I think that's probably the best legacy I can live behind. Not necessarily financial, but I would say opportunities of thought, leadership, opportunities opportunities of knowledge, opportunities of just having access that allows them to create greater impact in their lifetime. I think that would be a legacy that would be meaningful for, I think, my children and their families to ride on and to leverage on. And what do you think are the most important qualities of a successful person? 
I think success needs to be defined. I don't personally define success as monetary. In fact, it's far from that. I think success to me is probably defined as having the ability to spend time the way you want it, to create the impact that you want that goes on to create so much value for the world, so much bigger than yourself. And that could really come in the form of everything else from becoming a great teacher that changes the lives of thousands of children to a great humanitarian nonprofit leader that goes on to impact communities all around the world. To me, that is success. And I think to have these traits that I think all successful people have that I have been learning to emulate, to study, to grow into, I think humility is definitely one of the key things I notice in all successful people. I think another one is probably just the, the discipline of being relentless of just a daily grind of not giving up of just this constant desire to win and succeed with the humility of knowing that failure will come I think these two things have really been the defining traits that I've noticed and I hold true and hold close to who I try to be day to day to find success in the definition that perhaps I believe in and where can people go to find you and support everything that you and Hatmail are doing well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm quite active on LinkedIn. I'm not so much on Instagram or ironically not on TikTok. I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit. I do read every LinkedIn message I receive. I do share a lot of content on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best place to find me. And anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered yet? If you're somebody who's thinking of an idea, who's stuck in a position of, should I start something? Should I do something? Be it from a creation perspective or be it from a business perspective, I think my encouragement is just do it. A pandemic is obviously very challenging for many people in many ways, but also the pandemic resets a lot of opportunities for many people. There are many industries and businesses and things that are going into a mode of being reset. And post-pandemic, there will be a lot of new opportunities that will spread bring up. And that is actually something that you cannot miss. Uh, as an entrepreneur, that's something I think a lot about. What is the post-pandemic world looking like? And what are opportunities there that one can leverage on or one can take advantage of? So I think that's something to maybe encourage the listeners. If there's anybody who's in this rut and trying to get out of it, just start something. You never know where that might take you.